Max Nation. I'm Unger to the Max coming at you with today's episode of the Sports Room Talk Show. It is week 12 of the 2023 season, and the Cleveland Browns are headed out west for two straight games. This week, they are headed to the Rocky Mountains to take on the Denver Broncos. Yes. So, to talk about this matchup between the Cleveland Browns and Denver Broncos from the a- MHRT Network. Hopefully I got that right. Oh, yeah. All right, cool. I am welcoming, let me see if I can get this right, Mundingus Creepy into the sports room. Did I get that right? Close. Everybody calls me Mundingus because they're making fun of me, but Mundungus. Okay, Mundungus. I apologize. But it's welcome all good. into the room, my friend. I'm I'm glad you reached out so I could join you. It's uh, it's always fun when I get to talk football with with other people other than the people I always talk football with. Yeah. So we've got two hot teams coming into this game. These two teams have won a combined seven games in a row. Which, as a Browns fan, I did not see this coming, especially because now we have Dorian Thompson Robinson as our quarterback, given that mm-hmm. Deshaun Watson is now done for the season with a shoulder injury that he had to have surgery on. <laughs> but yeah. for the Broncos, you guys needed a last-second touchdown miracle pass, I would say, from Russell Wilson to, I believe it was Cortland Sutton, to beat the mm-hmm. Minnesota Vikings last week. How are you feeling about your Broncos so far this season? Man, I was terrified at the very beginning of the season, and then we progressively got worse, got blown out by the Dolphins. They scored 70 points. When does that happen? It doesn't. It was horrible. Uh, started 1-5, and five, now we're 5-5, five and five, and with without having Russell Wilson throw to Cortland Sutton, I think it's been the last three games, he's had to bail us out on a miracle catch to either – Score a touchdown or get us in field goal range and kick a field goal. We're sitting at like two and eight right now. So I'm glad he's figuring it out. I'm glad that Peyton's getting everything figured out. And it's going to make for a pretty good game today because we got, you know, the potential for your division to be run by the Browns. And we've got the potential for the Broncos to make the wild card. So it's, it's going to be a big game. Yeah. But, um, The Browns have not fared well against the Broncos historically. Denver leads the series 24-7. And, of course, when you think of the Browns and Broncos, you have to go back to the late 80s, the drive, the fumble. Browns fans, I'm so sorry for bringing up those terrible (laughs) memories. I was not even alive for either one of those, so I can't um, join you in the somberness of those moments, but I know those are dark moments for Browns fans. Of course, high moments for the Broncos, because we all know this type of success the Broncos had with John Elway. Two yep. Super Bowls. Yeah, back to back. It was great. I was kind of hoping that Manning was going to be able to do that, but we kind of got screwed that the, the year before, uh, 2014, I think it was. Yeah, I think so. Uh, oh, against the Colts in the divisional round, I believe it was? I believe so. And then 2013 was even worse because we had the, the best statistical offense like of all time up to that point uh, and then got screwed over by the Ravens. No, that was the super – that was the year you, uh, you just got smashed by the Seahawks. In the yeah, C- yep, that was the Seahawks. I don't want to talk about that either. <laughs> <laughs> um. But, hey, I mean, you guys have gone from, well, I would say from John Elway to Peyton Manning, but there was a lot of other quarterbacks in that mix before you got to Peyton Manning, and there's been a lot of quarterbacks in the mix after Peyton Manning. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) you know, you and I were talking about this before the show about how the Browns and Broncos are like mirror images of each other. There it is right there, because, I mean, the Browns have had Jake DeLome, Colt McCoy, Seneca Wallace, Thad Lewis, Spurgeon Wynn, Brandon Wien, uh, 
Johnny Manziel. I don't want to talk about him. Robert, <laughs> Robert Griffin the third, Bernie Kosar, um, Trent Dilfer, Josh McCown, some other guy with the last name of McCown, uh, um, Charlie Fry, Derek Anderson. I'm sure I'm leaving out some names, but you get my point. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's been ridiculous. And, and like you can look back at the history of the Browns over the last 20 years and the history of the Broncos over the last 20 years. Anytime we have a good quarterback, right after that quarterback leaves, it's complete hell for <laughs> a good – a good 10 years until we figure it out. I mean, I don't even know if I can list all the ones we've had since, man. It's see, it's been Osweiler. We had Drew Locke. We had Trevor Simeon. We had Joe Flacco. We, we've had. Um, Didn't you have Chad Kelly? Chad, yeah, but he was never really a starter. He was going to be. And then he decided to go hump a vacuum or something like that. And then he, he's gone. Uh, <laughs> and now he's like outstanding player of the year in the CFL or something like that. Oh. Um, Teddy Bridgewater. There's another one. Um, Paxton Lynch. Good God. <laughs> Let's not talk about that one. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, we were talking about similarities earlier. You've got Russell Wilson, who's on an, a huge contract. And last year did not live up to the contract. <laughs> I know this where you're year, going with this. This year, he's at least playing a lot better, and I think we're, at least we're seeing more of the old Russ, but the aging Russ. So he's like he, he was in the past, but slowing down. And then you've got uh, Deshaun Watson, who's not playing anymore, who's on $230 million guaranteed. And listen, every, every team's got their favorite quarterback. I don't know if Deshaun Watson is. But he's definitely not worth two hundred thirty million guarantee at this no, point. No, no. Um, I when I found out the Browns were trained for him, I did not have a major reaction to it because I knew all the baggage that was going to come with him, given all the off the field stuff. I don't want to get into all that. Mm -hmm. Um. But, you know, he's suspended for the first 11 games of the season last year. And the NFL can deny it all they want. They intentionally made his return game be the game in Houston against yep. the Texans. You can't tell me otherwise. Personally, I think it would have been better if he came back for the game in Miami. Because the, the storylines there would have been really good. You know, the Dolphins for a while were in the conversation like... Are they going to trade for Deshaun Watson and replace Tua? So I think that would have been a really interesting storyline. But nonetheless, and then he comes back this season and he's maybe had like two good halves of football. Like he played well, you know, in the second half last or two weeks ago, I should say, against Baltimore going 14 of 14, helping us win that game. And I would say the first half against the Tennessee Titans back in week three. But other than that, I can't definitively say, you know, he's had a good half of football. So right now I would say the Houston Texans won that trade hands down. Oh, yeah. like Deshaun Watson next season is going to really have to show me that he can get back to you know, the good version of himself in order to prove to me, like, hey, it was worth the assets we gave up to bring him in. Because right now, I'm not convinced. I would have preferred to keep Baker Mayfield, even though Baker, we were talking about this before the show, Baker just tried to be too much of a tough guy. You know, like... When he sustained that shoulder injury, he should have sat down for the rest of the season, gotten the surgery, and then come back fully healthy the next year. He didn't need to come in, continue playing and say, hey, look at me. I'm a tough guy. I can be a Cleveland man or however you want to say it. He didn't need to do that. Um, and like you said, the money that we gave to Deshaun Watson – 
we could have given to shore up our offensive line, gotten another wide receiver to go alongside Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham Jr. Or, you know, we could have another given... another tight end next to Joku. Yes, right. Or how about or how about this? We could have given Jacoby Brissett a contract extension because he was playing well for us. You know, he beat Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in what turned out to be Tom Brady's final game in Cleveland, which I was at that game. I was also at um, Peyton Manning's final game in Cleveland back in 2015 when you guys beat us in overtime. But regardless of you beating us in overtime, for me, that's still huge that we were able to take both Peyton Manning and Tom Brady into overtime in their final visits to Cleveland. Like for that's like a small piece. And I know in sports, there's no such thing as a moral victory, but that's just a really cool, like token for me that like we took Peyton Manning and Tom Brady into overtime. Right. And, and no offense against Russell Wilson because I, I do believe Russell Wilson is eventually going to go in the Hall of Fame. I think we'll have to see. But you've got a Cleveland defense throughout history that has been good. And you've got that defense that takes Tom Brady and Peyton Manning to overtime. And that doesn't even compare to the defense you guys have this year. Like, the, you guys have the best defense this year in the NFL. And so yeah. – that's where I think that this game is going to get interesting because, like we said before, these teams kind of mirror each other, right? Like, over the last five, six games, Denver's defense has been able to figure it out. They're uh, number one in, in points allowed over the last five, six games. They're number two in, in turnover ratio. And then you've got the Browns who've got the number one defense. So this is going to be a defensive struggle with two offenses that are still trying to figure it out. Yes. Where you guys might be able to exploit us, though, is on the back end because Denzel Ward is out for us and Juan Thornhill is questionable. So that could open things up for the passing game for Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy to possibly hurt us. And plus, you have Russell Wilson who... Like you said, he's not necessarily in his prime anymore, but he's shown that he has the ability to revert back to the Seattle version of himself, for lack of a better term, where he can make those off-schedule plays where he just runs around and extends plays. That's not going to be easy for Miles Garrett, Zadarius Smith, Sione Takitaki, um, Jeremiah Wusa koromoda to keep him contained in the pocket because he's still really good at escaping the pocket and making something out of nothing. Yeah, and, and I love the fact that Russell Wilson is the number one rated quarterback in fourth quarter comebacks, in game-winning drives, things like that. But at the same time, if he keeps it up, I'm going to have to go get some heart medicine. Because it's like every week, it's down to two minutes, we're trailing, and then we come back and we win it with like 30 seconds left. Hey, the Browns like to do the same thing, so I know exactly <laughs> what you're doing. But um, I do find this interesting. The Browns are 7-3, and three, and mm -hmm. yet here's the thing. At, while the Broncos are 5-5, five and five, and yet maybe the, it's because the game is in Denver – but you guys are actually a slight favorite. I'm looking on the ESPN app. You guys right now are a two-point favorite. See, and I've always told my guys on the network and on my show, I don't think home field advantage makes a difference, at least with teams that aren't used to winning, right? So Denver's been a losing team for eight years now. So for me, it doesn't matter if it's home or away because the guys don't know how to win yet. Like, they'll get there, and I think they're working on it, but I I, I don't know. Because the Broncos' offense, and, and one of the things I said on my show on Tuesday was I think the Broncos need to air it out against the Browns. Because 
you watch the last couple games that they've played, it's run, run, pass, run, run, pass, run, run, bootleg, run, run, screen. That's all they, they don't air it out. And with Cortland Sutton, Jerry, Judy, Marvin Mims, you should be able to air it out. And I don't know why they haven't. I think it's something they need to exploit. I'm hoping they know that because if I know that and they don't, then there's a problem. But I think the Broncos need to air it out because I don't think that they're going to be able to get the running yardage that they want against the front seven of the Browns. Hey, speaking of running, I know your running back really well, Jaleel McLaughlin. Um, the reason I know him is because he actually started his college career at my mm-hmm. alma mater. He Ooh. started his college career at Notre Dame College in South Euclid, which is a suburb of Cleveland. Um, and then he transferred to Youngstown State. And now, of course, he's your running back. But so I take and I have him on my fantasy team. But unfortunately, I, I have him on my bench today. Um, so hopefully. He no, I. I get it. I had I had Amari Cooper starting on my team last because I figured last week is DTR first start, right? So in my mind, it's like okay, first start bailout's going to be Amari Cooper. So I started Amari Cooper over Tank Dell. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's how my um, week went last week. Yeah, but so this game's going to be a little bit weird for me, being that Jaleel is on the other side, and I'm like. He went to my alma mater, but I have to root against him because he plays for the Broncos. But at the same time, I'm like, I want him to do well because, again, he went to my alma mater. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I hope he does well, too. I think I think he's been misused. Um, he's, you know, there, were, there were some instances where Cortland Sutton would be back in the backfield blocking and then getting a screen. When it, sh- when it should have been McLaughlin, right? Or then you have Marvin Mims doing all these end arounds. It's like, why not let, let McLaughlin run it? Like, why are you having wide receivers in the backfield taking screens and doing end arounds when you have a guy like McLaughlin, right? Yes. I love this from my friend Jesse Almeida. Meanwhile, we have Mac Jones, who is a walking turnover. I am a Bailey Zappi fan. I wanted Denver to draft Bailey Zappi. I know that Mac Jones is starting, but I think Bailey Zappi's going to get it. I love Bailey Zappi. Air raid offense. Okay. So let me ask you this then. Do you think that even with the contract extension you recently gave to Russell Wilson, do you think there's a possibility the Broncos could draft a quarterback in the upcoming draft this season? Ooh, okay. So – I think Denver's probably going to be in the 17 to 23 range. So I think if we did, we'd be looking at like a J.J. McCarthy or something like that, something in the later first round. But I wouldn't have a problem, and and I've talked about this before, I wouldn't have a problem with Denver sticking with Russell Wilson and bringing in like a Baker Mayfield or moving on from Russ and bringing in a Baker and then drafting someone in like the third or fourth round. Because, I mean, just because you get a first-round quarterback doesn't mean he's a franchise quarterback, right? Like, we've all seen Tom Brady. Six-round pick. Killing it, right? So, I I think that it it's – Shadur Sanders obviously isn't coming out. So, I do think that it's going to be like a J.J. McCarthy-type quarterback, something like that. Uh, but only if they keep Russell Wilson. Because technically, Denver has an out to help clear some cap space with Russell Wilson this year, but I don't think they're going to take it. Yeah. I love this. Jesse goes, hey, if you need a quarterback, you can have Mac if you want next year. (laughs) I mean, I wanted to draft Mac Jones too. So I I don't know. Like, is is it a Mac Jones problem or is it a coaching problem? You know, because like everyone's – Bill Belichick's the greatest coach of all time. Well, with Tom Brady not there. Is he? Yeah. Um, I was actually at that draft when uh, Mac Jones got take drafted by the Patriots because that draft was here in Cleveland. Um, although I only stayed for the first three picks it was, so I was there for 
Trevor Lawrence getting drafted, mm -hmm. Zach Wilson getting drafted, and Trey Lance getting drafted. Only one of those guys has worked out. <laughs> Speaking of Trey Lance, not to like go off the rails here, but what about the Browns or the Broncos bringing in a Trey Lance? Because, hmm. I mean, you've got – obviously, you're keeping Deshaun Watson, right? There's really no out with Deshaun Watson's contract because it's all guaranteed. Right. Mm -hmm. But if DTR doesn't work out, right, do you go with like – do you take a chance on a Trey Lance? It's an interesting idea. I mean, personally, I wish we had kept uh, Jacoby Brissett because he played well for us, and I don't know why we just let him walk and go to Washington. So that would be my first choice. I wish we had traded for him at the trade deadline. But um, in terms of Trey Lance, so basically you're saying you don't think he's going to stay in Dallas. For, for what? Because, I mean, right. obviously, da like, Dak's not going anywhere. Jerry Jones never lets a – let's say he's an average quarterback with a really good offensive line, right? I, I think I think that's safe. Jerry Jones will never let him go. So, I if Trey Lance wants a chance of being a starter, it's not going to be in Dallas. He's going to have to go somewhere else. Okay. My best guess is that it would probably he would probably have more of a chance in Denver um rather than Cleveland because of Deshaun Watson's contract. I don't think there's a way a easy way for the Browns to get off of that. Woof. Whereas like you were saying the Broncos have the option to get out from under Russell Wilson if they choose to take it. And then they can bring in somebody like a Trey Lance. So, I would yeah. say Denver. Okay. Um, so, one of the other things I, I wanted to talk about, and this might hurt a little bit, but I want to talk about it anyways. Nick Chubb. Yeah. Lost, lost for the season. That's, Kareem Hunt is good. But Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb as a duo is better than just Kareem Hunt. Now the Browns Don't have been good in the about run. Jerome Ford. The yeah, Jerome right Ford. Back. They're good, and I know that Denver's defense has been awful against the run. Do you think that the Browns focus on the run and just keep running Kareem Hunt and Ford, or no? Well, the Browns have always primarily been a run-first team, so I don't see why they would change that now but i do wish they would utilize the play action pass a little bit more sometimes i think they become too dependent on running the ball to the point where teams are just gonna stack the box and say dtr or deshaun watson or whoever it is at under center for the browns in the future um you have to beat us it's kind of like what Defenses were doing with Baker Mayfield. Like, one team saw that we were going to be heavily dependent on the run. They just stacked the box and said, okay, we're taking away the run. Baker Mayfield, you go out there and beat us. And Baker Mayfield was unable to do it. Um, and so far, Deshaun Watson hasn't shown that he can do it. Yes, he, I know he went 14 of 14 against the Ravens in the second half, but during the tenure of his Browns career so far, one, he hasn't been able to stay on out on the field. And two, he hasn't when he has been out on the field, he hasn't shown that consistency to the point where it's like, oh, he can constantly make that throw when it's necessary. He can, you know, read the defense and get off option one and go to option two or, you know, he can scramble and all that. I haven't seen that from him. So right. I would say the Browns need to run the ball. I'd like to see them use the play action game a little bit more though. Okay. Um but in terms of your offense, 
I feel like the Broncos are going to try and exploit the loss of Denzel Ward. Because I feel like he probably would have been matched up with Cortland Sutton. Because I'd view Cortland as your number one wide receiver. And mm-hmm. maybe I'm wrong about that. But as an outsider, because I'm not a Broncos fan, that's how I view it. Um, so I feel like Denver's going to try and take advantage of that matchup. Yeah, Cortland's definitely done one wide receiver on the Broncos. We thought it was going to be Jerry Judy at the beginning of the year, but he just – he I, – I don't know. The way that – like when you watch the game and you see what happens, it looks to me like Jerry Judy gets open so fast that Russ isn't even out of his drop yet before he's open and then covered again. And so – the ball hasn't gone his way when it did. He dropped a big touchdown pass in the end zone last week uh, against the Vikings, which is what caused us to have to have Cortland Sutton bail us out. Um, the Broncos do have a lot of options as far as receivers go with Sutton, Judy, and Mims. The problem is is the tight ends that we have without having Greg Dulcich in there are mostly blocking tight ends. They're not big in, in the passing. I'm not saying they can't catch the ball. Because obviously they can. But they're primarily used as blockers instead of Dulcich, who is more of the Travis Kelsey type. I'm not I'm not saying he's like Travis Kelsey, but he has that that catching ability, right? Like he's not just used as a blocking tight end. He goes out and runs routes and catches the ball. Um, so one of the things I think the Browns could do, even without Denzel Ward, is if you're able to – get a hold on Cortland Sutton and keep him covered, you're going to stand a better chance of success in winning because we've had issues getting Judy the ball, getting Mims in the right place, and things like that. So Denzel Ward not being there definitely is is a big hit for you guys. Um, And I I hope that we can exploit it, but our our offense is still trying to figure it out, and I'm, I'm not sure when they're going to, but I'm hoping they figure it out quick. Um, obviously, you guys are going to have the home field advantage, given that you know you're used to the lack of oxygen and all that. But I do want to bring this up. Last week, the Denver Nuggets, the reigning defending NBA champions, came to Cleveland to take on the Cavaliers. Um. And the Cavaliers defeated the Nuggets by a wide margin. I think it was like 121 to 101 or something. I don't remember the exact score off the top of my head. So I wonder if somebody from the Nuggets called up the Broncos and said, Hey, we know you're hosting the Browns this week. Can you get some revenge for us? Maybe. Listen, I was at the game last week and I was at the game against the Jets, right? Altitude, I like you don't really feel the altitude until you start doing something. When you try to climb them stairs in that stadium, it is exhausting. I have never been I like I'm a big guy, I don't like stairs. But I can normally handle stairs. Okay. I was almost dead by the time I got up to my seat. There's so many stairs, too much elevation, it sucks. Yeah. Um, by the way, Cavs beat the Nuggets 121 to 109. So my guess is somebody from the Nuggets called up the Broncos and said, hey, can you get some revenge on on the city of Cleveland for us by beating the Browns today? Maybe that's just me making something up in my head that didn't actually happen. But I still like to think it happened anyway. I don't care. <laughs> um, anyway. But... Uh, You know, we were briefly talking about the history of this series earlier. Somehow, we've won two of the last three against the Broncos. But from 1991 to 2015, you guys just flat out dominated us, winning every single game. We've struggled up in Denver. I don't know what it is. Um, It could be the oxygen. I, I don't know. The one win we have recently up there is when Greg Williams was our interim head coach and Baker Mayfield was our starting quarterback. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I Listen, 
I know that Greg Williams was suspended for the paying players to hurt other players, right? Like, we all heard about that. I don't mind Greg Williams. I mean, there was obviously an issue when he called a zero blitz on the worst absolute time to call one. But I thought that the mix of Greg Williams with Baker Mayfield was a good mix. I thought it worked. I mean, Baker Mayfield was was the quarterback you guys had when you went to the playoffs for the first time in God knows how long. Right. So I, I've always been a fan of both. Um, you know, I – you can look back at the at the history of the Broncos. The Broncos have not struggled a lot in the history. But when you look over the last 10 years, there's been some struggles. It was uh especially the last eight without you know without Manning, obviously. It's it's been tough. And I that's one area where I, I think that the teams differ because ever since the, the Browns came back to Cleveland. It hasn't been great. Whereas right. the Broncos have been one of the best franchises in history up until the 2016 point. And then it's like, we kind of did this, you know, Browns went up, Broncos went down. Yes. So, um, although you guys started when you guys first came into the league, you had those really ugly jerseys with the, yep. Yeah, oh, had, like, I love those things. Jerseys. Brandon Marshall used to always wear those socks and then twist them. And so the stripes were going to die. I loved it. It was great. And then I loved it. The Broncos had a, like a huge bonfire to burn them. And then you switched to that, to the orange with the bright blue Jersey with the D and Mm -hmm. that's when the orange crush came into the, came into it. Of course, now, you guys, and of course, then you switch to the blue, which I know fans and press members did not like. But hey, you won back-to-back Super Bowl, so what the hell? The Browns don't even know what the what a Super Bowl is, for God's sake. The last time the Browns won a championship was in like nineteen sixty-four, or something like that. <laughs> it's been a minute. Yeah. Um, whereas you guys have. Won the Super Bowl in 2015. You won the Super Bowl in 1998. You won the Super Bowl in 1997. Yeah. But I'm looking at some of your stats. um, And we were talking about Jaleel McLaughlin earlier. You can't forget Mm -hmm. about Javante Williams earlier when it comes to your running game. Yeah, and he's coming. He's coming off that ACL tear, um, and it was a bad one too. So normally, when you tear your ACL, right, it's just the ACL that's in the front of your knee. But Javante tore the ACL, the LCL, and the I think it's the PCL. He tore all three, and so in our minds, it was holy crap. We're not going to get him back for two years if if he plays again ever. And then this offseason, he showed up in a brace and has been good to go ever since. Um, you know, it's, it's taken him a minute to get back into running form like he has been over the last couple of years. Um, but he's back. He seems to be running hard. He's, he's starting to get his, his yard average up. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the, the bright spots in the running game. I mean, Samaji P Ryan, we brought in from the Bengals. Um, a lot of the damage that he's doing is in like the dump offs. Um, like he was huge on that last drive against Minnesota. He bailed us out of, I think three, fourth downs by just being open five yards deep, dump it off. And then he'll run it for 20 yards. So it's, that's, I think that's where the good mix comes in. Right. And that's why I want to see Jaleel McLaughlin get more involved in the end arounds and the screens. Cause then you've got, um, Javante Williams running the ball at the middle. You've got some IGP Ryan where you can dump off within five yards, and you got Jaleel McLaughlin in the backfield running around being more like a Debo Samuel type guy, right? So basically, you want Samaj P. Ryan and Jaleel McLaughlin to be more like hybrids and have Javante be your primary back. If I'm he- yeah, and and I and Javante is the primary back. Samaj P. Ryan is good. Um, 
I, I don't think he's had as much success up the middle as Javante has. And he's not as fast as Jaleel McLaughlin. So for me, it would be better to have Javante up the middle uh-huh. and then, you know, around the edges. Um, and then have Samaji P. Ryan be the guy that you're getting the dump off to on the, the outside or have him run five yards and run a hook and then throw it to him there, be the dump off guy. And then instead of having Marvin Mims be the end around guy, let McLaughlin do it. That's what he's there for. He's got the speed. He's got the yeah. vision. Let him do uh, it. Yeah. So given the way our defense can ru- heat up the pocket, do you think Sean Payne's going to um, include some design quarterback runs for Russell Wilson today? Because I'm kind of expecting that. Given See, and what that's- Russ has shown the past couple weeks. And, and Russ, there there were times in the Vikings game, there were times in the Bills game, and there were times in the Chiefs game where there was an open pocket, there was an open lane, and instead of running it to go get a first down or pick up five yards, he would hold on to it and throw the ball, which obviously is one of those things that Russell Wilson's been doing since he was drafted, right? Like he holds on to the ball a little bit too long to try to make something happen. Instead of taking the running lane, he'll hold on to it and throw it. I don't know if they're going to give him design runs. I think this game is going to be just like it was against the Vikings, where it's going to be a lot of dump-offs, a lot of screens, a lot of short dump-offs, uh, check-downs, things like that. I, I think they're wanting to try to keep Russell Wilson upright. So you don't think they're going to try any deep passes to Judy or Sutton, or is it just going to be like a handful? I want every single play to be a deep throw. Every one, like throw it deep on every play, but going by what they've done over the past five games, I, it, that's not going to, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be a lot of, it, it seems like what Sean Payton is wanting to do is get the ball out quick to a dump off, to a screen, uh, bootleg play action, whatever it is, and then let, and then let the guys get yak. It seems like that's what they're wanting to do. Dump it off quick. Go get Yak. Yeah. Again, this is another area where the Browns and Broncos are similar. Because I, even with Desh- Deshaun Watson in there, it feels like the Browns don't really want to throw the ball deep either. Even though we have the likes of Amari Cooper, you know, um, Elijah Moore, who we got in a trade this offseason from the New York Jets. David Bell, the wide receiver from Purdue. We have Cedric Tillman, the wide receiver we drafted from Tennessee. You know, David Njoku, who we drafted a few years ago out of Miami. Like, we have capable pass catchers who can make the deep ball catch, but it seems like the Browns don't really want to do that. But here's the key difference. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. Cortland Sutton, Bron- from what I understand, Broncos fans feel like he's the number one wide receiver. From what I've seen on the field, the Broncos feel the same way. Mm-hmm. When I watch the Browns, and some Browns fans have gotten on me for this, but I'm going to continue to say that. Amari Cooper, he has, while he's, like, he's starting to show me more consistency, he hasn't shown me quite enough to where I can definitively say he's the number one wide receiver for the Browns. I can't definitively say that. I want to, but like when you look at his stats, it's just not quite there. Like I'll pull up some of his stats now. Give me a sec. Um, Like, it, through 10 games, he's had 40, 45 receptions, two touchdowns, 749 mm-hmm. yards for an average of about 16.6 yards. Like, to, I don't know about you, but to me, that doesn't sound like a number one wide receiver. No, and, and Amari Cooper was a number one wide receiver with the Raiders. But yes. since he left the Raiders, he's been a number two. And yes. I think... I think Amari Cooper was has always been a number two, 
but the Raiders didn't have another option, right? He was their number one because he's all they had. Then he goes to where Dallas. do you go to next? Dallas. He goes to yes. Dallas. They got CeeDee Lamb. CeeDee Lamb's number one. Amari Cooper's number two. N- number one, Dallas never should have let him go. Amari no. Cooper should still be at Dallas. And I th- I think that the Browns bringing in Cooper and then bringing in Moore, they're thinking Elijah Moore is going to take over that number one spot, right? When when they first brought him in, I'm assuming that's what the plan was. That would be my guess, but like Elijah Moore so far, 40 receptions um, on 34. Yeah, 40 receptions on 64 targets, 374 yards, averages a about 9.4 yards and only one touchdown. Yeah, that no, Man. that's not number one. No. <laughs> no. I like when we had Jarvis Landry, guess what? He was the number one wide receiver. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know why we let him go. Like if we still had Jarvis Landry, I think this offense would be clicking so much better even without even with the loss of Nick Chubb, like Jarvis Landry would take up the number one role because that's what his role was when he was here. Amari Cooper would be that number two option, which as you stated, that's his, that's what he's better suited for. Elijah Moore would be that number three position, which I think he's better suited for anyway. Um, You would still have David Njoku. At the tight end position, we we have Harrison Bryant, which I would like to see the Browns use more twelve personnel and go to that two tight end set, um, because it would give DTR or PJ Walker, Deshaun Watson, whoever, more options. Like, so you're not just limited to Amari Cooper, Elijah Moore, or David Njoku. Sometimes it's it gets a little concerning with the lack of weapons the Browns give their quarterbacks. Yeah, and and that's where, you know, we talked about earlier how Denver and and Cleveland seem to be right on that same level, right? Great defense trying to figure out the offense. The difference is I think Denver has the players in place to be able to be a great offense. They're just trying to figure it out, right? Whereas with Cleveland – and listen, I've never been a fan of Deshaun Watson. I never will be a fan of Deshaun Watson. I can totally respect but that, barring and that. I like, understand that. I still don't think he's 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 the the guy. Like I, I understand he's getting paid two hundred thirty million guaranteed, but he's he's just he's not it. Right. And I don't know if DTR is. I don't know if they're going to bring somebody else in. But they they need to get that number one wide receiver and. The, the part that sucks about being a good football team when it comes to the draft and you know what you're missing is wide receiver or running back or tackle or quarterback, whatever it may be, you know that you're going to have to be in that top six to get the guy you want. Like, for example, let's say you take Marvin Harrison Jr. and you put him on the Browns. But how much are you going to have to give up in order to get – to that top five, top six spot to get him, right? Right, and the Browns don't have that type of capital to be able to move up because of what they had to, you know, give up in the trade with the Texans for Deshaun Watson. Not including the cap hit that Deshaun Watson has. Exactly. Um, Like like I was saying earlier, I kind of wish we had kept Jacoby Brissett. Like, at least he was giving us chances to win and we were staying in every single game um granted this season like we haven't really been blown out in any of our losses um except for week four when dtr didn't know he was starting to like saturday night or sunday morning and we got destroyed by the ravens 28 to 3 in what was his actual first career start, but this past week was, so I guess this past week was his 
second career start, but he had a full week of practice and whatnot. Right. So you can say it's his first full week. I'm not going to correct you there. But if we had Jacoby Brissett, which I think we did try to trade for him at the trade deadline, Washington was just asking too much. But if we had been able to pull off the trade for him, I'd feel better, you know, not just about this game, but next week against the Rams, the following week against the Jaguars, week 16 against the Texans, because those are our key games. No disrespect to the Jag- to the um, Bears or the Bengals, but for me, it's today against the Broncos, next week against the Rams, week 14, the following week against the Jaguars, and week 16 against the Texans. Those are our key games the rest of the way. Maybe if the Jets get Aaron Rodgers back, then that could be a key game. But right now, the Jets are a mess. So, I'm not yeah. that's a key game for the Browns. No, and, and like, I completely understand where the Browns are right now, right? Like, the Browns are being carried by their defense. Because exactly. they have a great defense. 2015, Denver won the Super Bowl because of the defense. Like, I get it. I'm, I'm right there with you. I completely understand where you're coming from. You're loving the defense, you're loving the turnovers, and then you watch the offense. Yes. And you just get aggravated. Yes, <laughs> like, exactly. On. But, hey, at least you had the sheriff leading you on offense. So, you and still had Demarius Thomas, God rest his soul. Mm-hmm. I, I just want to take a minute. I... I'm not like a Broncos fan, so I didn't have the same reaction. I'm sure yet all Broncos fans had <laughs> yet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. <laughs> but it, I have to admit, even I was a little bit devastated when I heard that Demarius Thomas had passed away. Because I was when I saw Broncos games, like out of everybody on the field. Von Miller, T.J. Ward, Peyton Manning, um, you know, Julius Thomas, Wes Welker, um, Eric Decker. I wanted to see what was Demarius Thomas going to do because it just seemed like when it was a big game for the Broncos, whether it was against the Patriots or um, I'm trying to think who are some of the other. The, the Steelers in the playoffs. Woo! Yes, the Steelers with Tim Tebow. It was always <laughs> Demarius Thomas making the big play for you. Of course, mm-hmm. I mean no disrespect towards Von Miller or TJ Ward or any of the other guys who made like big plays in their time with Denver. But there was just something about Demarius where I'm like, oh, he's going to make some type of big play where you're like, mm-hmm. how did he do that? Or you're just like, um, defense. You might want to come. You might want to cover that guy because he keeps destroying you. And if he had gotten to continue playing, he was well on his way to the Hall of Fame easily. I think. Yeah, I I agree. I think uh, you know it. It sucks that we that we traded him from the Broncos to the Texans. And then funny part about that. We trade him to the Texans. Our next game is against the Texans. So he went from Denver to Houston and then right back to Denver because we we played him. Um, but, uh, like, I would have loved to have been able to see a Demarius Thomas, Cortland Sutton, like, full-on oh, duo, man. right? That would have been great. I would have loved that, even I as would, a, would, an yeah. NFL fan. But um, it meant like Emmanuel Sanders, Demarius Thomas was a good mix. So, yes, I of I of course I forgot Emmanuel Sanders um, when I was mentioning some of the others. But hey, um, T.J. Ward, I know he's not with the Broncos anymore, but it was uh, a little weird to see him win a Super Bowl ring with the Broncos back in 2015 because <laughs> he was because you know where he started his career or. I don't mm-hmm. know if he started his career with us off the top of my head, but guess where he really made his name outside of Denver? Right here in Cleveland. Yep. 
And I'm just like, of course that happens. Of course he goes on to win a Super Bowl with somebody other than Cleveland. It's just fitting. Yeah. But I'll, I'll give you this, though. Like, you look at the AFC West divisions, right? If there was going to be a tough, like the toughest division in the AFC is probably yours. Steelers, yes. Bengals, Browns. That That's tough. And like, the Ravens. The, 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 yeah, the Ravens. The Broncos have the Chiefs. And then other than that, like, it, I mean, the Chargers are good for the first half and then horrible in the second half. And who knows what the hell's going on with the Raiders. But, I mean, you look at your division, all four of the teams in your division are potential playoff teams. Yeah. I mean, there's a path where if things work out in the right way, the Browns could not only end up in first place in the AFC North, but they could end up as the number one seed in the AFC if things fall their way today. Do I think all those things are going to happen? No, I don't. But the fact that that's even a possibility is insane, given the way our season has played out. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier. This is actually the first of two years in a row that we're going to play the Bron- you guys in Denver because we're mm-hmm. playing you today, uh, given we both finished in the same spot in the standings last year and then next year the AFC North faces the AFC West which means we'll be at Denver we'll be at Vegas and we'll host the Chargers and we'll host Kansas City um so this is gonna be good for us to experience Denver so we'll have an idea of what it's like when we come back next year will it be week three 12 when it, we come back next season? Probably not, because I don't think the NFL would do that, but yeah. who the hell knows? Well, and, and again, this is where everything gets interesting, because now you have, uh, and, and I don't know about the Browns, but next week the Broncos take on the Texans, and that's another team that is is vying for a playoff spot, along with Denver. You've got Cleveland pushing for the division lead, pushing for Number one seed pushing for whatever they may may be pushing for, whether it's wild card, whether it's division, whether it's whatever it is. But now is the time where we're starting to get into those games that actually mean something, right? Like you look back at those games from the earlier in the season, you're like, ah, it's not really going to matter much. Now they kind of do because now we're starting to get into the the mix of playoff hopefuls that are all playing each other in the middle. Yes, we have the Rams next week in L.A. So what I'm hoping the Browns do, since we're playing in Denver today, is instead of flying all the way back to Cleveland, they just stay out west and go practice somewhere in L.A. for the week. That Because to me, it, it would just be silly to go all the way back to Cleveland just to head back out west again. Um Um, That's just my take on it. But anyway, I want to talk about your defense, though. Mm -hmm. Early in the season, you mentioned it earlier, you guys gave up 70 points to the Miami Dolphins. 70. And now, how has Vance Joseph been able to turn this unit around? Because I look at the Broncos' defense now, and I'm like, that's not the same defense I saw earlier in the season. No, and and I, I've asked myself the same question. I've asked other people the same question. And the, the answer I keep coming to, right, mm-hmm. is you look at the Broncos in the first six games of the season. Absolutely horrible. Defense was miserable. And what was happening was Vance Joseph was trying to pair Vic Fangio's defense with his own. Because we've got the Vic Fangio personnel, right? Yeah. So Denver was playing a lot more zone, playing a lot more, um, you know, give them the room, pass people off kind of defense. The problem was is that the defense wasn't communicating. And so when when people would get – when receivers would get passed off to the, to the safety or to the other corner, right, or from linebacker to safety, they weren't talking so nobody knew who was going where. 
And so it was leaving a lot of the field open. And it, it looks like in the last five games, it's been more of a Vance Joseph defense, more of the cover two that he likes to run, more of the blitz that he likes to run. Uh, the corners are playing a more man than they are zone, which is what they were playing. Um, and the biggest thing, and, and this was one of the things that um, when I went to the, the, the Jets game against the Broncos, we talked to Nick Ferguson. Nick Ferguson was um, an ex-Broncos player, and he he was saying the biggest problem with the defense is that they're not communicating. And so if you look at the defense now, you can see that they're starting to communicate. Like, hey, I'm going here, you're going there. Who's taking the, the pickoff? Who's doing what? And so now you can see that the defense is communicating. The defense is doing more man. The defense is more in Vance Joseph's control where he's running what he wants instead of trying to combine the two. So th- this is the first game since Kareem Jackson was suspended, right? Again, yes. <laughs> um, do you think the Browns are going to try and exploit him not being there? In some no. Way? And, and this is why. So Kareem Jackson has been the starting safety opposite Justin Simmons for the last – Four seasons, three seasons, three, four, somewhere in there. But if you look at PJ Locke, who is the backup for Kareem Jackson when the season started, the defense is different when PJ Locke is on the field as opposed to Kareem Jackson. Um, Kareem Jackson, way? Kareem Jackson is a very hard hitting, run stopping safety. That's what he does. PJ Locke is better out in coverage, um, and so you're able to kind of give the receiver more buffer because you have someone like PJ Locke or Justin Simmons on the other side that's able to pick up coverage from the corners if they get burned or if they peel off and go somewhere else, right? So let's say you've got three receivers running deep and you've got a tight end. Now instead of having to have a linebacker and a bad matchup against Njoku, right? You can the corner can pass off the receiver to PJ Locke and then go help cover the tight end. And I think that's where the big difference comes in. Okay. Um I know at one point the Broncos were thought to be complete total sellers, and one of the names I kept hearing that might be traded was somebody who's come on strong for you defensively. I think you know who I'm talking about. Sertan. Maybe. Um, from everything I heard, Sertan was never on the trade block. Like, like they were taking calls about him, but he was going to garner two first-round picks. And nobody's going to sell two first-round picks at the trade deadline. Like, you just don't do that. Um, there was bigger – there was a bigger possibility of Sutton getting traded. Um, but I'm glad that they didn't trade anybody. I I honestly thought that the Broncos were probably going to sell Sutton and Simmons, which sucks because I didn't want to lose either one. But I'm glad they didn't because it's pretty obvious that they're starting to figure it out. Yeah. Um, the only move we made was train Donovan Peoples-Jones to the Detroit Lions in I was flying back from Seattle that day, and I got saw the news, and I'm like, wait, why'd we trade DPJ? Like, he was at least a viable skill position player for us on offense. So that move made no sense. But the guy, for some reason, I'm looking at your roster. Mm-hmm. The linebacker, Alex Singleton. Yeah. Do you do you think he's going to play a factor at all in this game, or is he just like more of a depth piece? So Alex Singleton is our starting uh, linebacker, and he's the Mike. He's the one that calls the plays. Okay. Um, here's here's the issue with Alex Singleton, right? I love Alex Singleton. He's all over the place. He is, I think, 11th in the NFL in tackles right now. But do you know what he's number one in? Miss tackles. Oh. So – I love him because he's a tackling machine, but I hate him because he's missing tackles that are causing the issues in our run defense. 
and causing the issues in coverage. So it's man, I I don't know. It it depends on if he's able to figure out how to stop missing tackles. So it feels like what from what you're saying, you think the Browns might have the might be able to just run all over the Broncos defensively. Every team has been able to the whole season, so I, I don't I don't see why I would say no this time. Um, I'm listen. I am very glad that Nick Chubb is not in the game because that guy is nuts. Um, he he would be one of those guys that runs for like 200 yards on the Broncos team. So I'm glad that he's not playing. Um, I'm I'm hoping that that Denver can figure it out, but I, I don't think that Denver has the right piece in the middle as far as defensive tackle goes and as far as middle linebacker goes to be able to successfully stop the run um, and just average, like just stop it on an average level, like keep it running back to 120 yards. But it seems like every team we play, they run for like 300 yards. See, I'm kind of nervous, not about your run game, but again, we've talked about it multiple times, but Russ's scrambling ability, like you can't give him a free po- like a free pocket. And like I know how good Miles Garrett is. He I would say he's the favorite for defensive player of the year right now. And I've loved the pairing of him and Zadarius Smith. Because if you double mm-hmm. Zadarius, you're getting Miles Garrett one on one. And if you double Miles Garrett, guess what? That gives the Darius Smith one on one, but they're not facing like a pocket passer today. Russell Wilson loves to scramble. He loves those off schedule plays. So, yeah. given that and the thin air and all lack of oxygen and all that up in Denver, I'm as a Browns fan, I'm legitimately concerned about that. Well, and Miles Garrett lines up on the left or the right. He's he's end right. Yeah. So is I, he left or right? Uh, I believe he lines up on the right, if I remember correctly. The defensive right. I believe so. I don't remember off the top of my head though. So it's so it's going to be Miles Garrett versus Garrett Bowles. Okay. Uh this is gonna be a long day. <laughs> <laughs> long day. Well, who? Wait. So, who would Zadarius Smith be going against then? Mike McGlinchey. Oh, the guy the 49ers drafted. So, if out he's, of Notre Dame. Mike McGlinchey is one of the best tackles when it comes to run blocking, but pass blocking is not his thing. Um, Garrett Bowles is also known as a holder. So I'm thinking that with Miles Garrett lining up opposite Garrett Bowles, we might see a lot of offensive holds on Garrett Bowles. I might have it reversed. I don't remember. Um, so don't hold me to that. Well, either way, even if Miles Garrett lines up on the left, now you've got Miles Garrett pass rushing against a not good pass blocker. So either so, way, so either Miles way, Garrett it's terrified. advantage Browns. It, advantage Miles Garrett, yeah. Okay. But I mean, there's not a lot of people other than maybe Trent Williams that can successfully block Miles Garrett. So, granted, we still beat the 49ers, which I have no idea how. Um, the Browns have got to be one of the luck- luckiest teams this season. I mean, you look at some of the ref calls that have gone our way this season and, you know, the missed field goals and stuff. And I'm just like, I have no idea how we keep winning these games. I genuinely don't. Like, last week, given that we were going against TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith, I mm-hmm. thought the two of them were going to just eat Dorian Thompson Robinson alive and the Steelers win. I was wrong there. When we went against the Ravens, given that Baltimore had just blown out Seattle and blown out Detroit and they had put up 30 points in their last three games, I thought the Ravens are just going to wreck us. 
and, you know, San Francisco. And they were coming off of destroying the Dallas Cowboys 42 to 10. So I'm like, yep, the Browns are going to get whooped. Browns won all three games. And I'm just like, how? Man, how? I'm right there with it. Did you watch that Bills Broncos game? And it, 12 men on the field. Right? How, How do we get – we miss a field goal and we get a 12 men on the field penalty and then win it. Like, and everybody – the funny thing was, after that game, nobody was – from what I heard, nobody was really giving the Broncos credit as much as people were like, Buffalo, how do you fuck that up? Right? <laughs> like, and it wasn't even like 11 guys on the field and one trying to run off. It was 12 men set. There were 12 yes. men on the field. And it was just like, obviously, you guys were going to have to run quickly to get your field goal unit on. But the Bills didn't have to change anything defensively. They could have kept yeah. the same personnel. And we would have missed it, and they would have won. Yes. Um, granted, you guys got a little bit lucky because of that pass interference call. Not that it yep. was a bad call, but still, you guys got extremely lucky yourselves. No, I, yeah, we uh, there's been a couple games this season we've won. That it's like, how did we win that game? We should not have won that game. Like, I would say last week against Minnesota, I saw the final score. I'm like, wait, what? How did Denver win? Well, and that's, I think, three out of the four. Because you look at the Bears game, right? The Bears game, yes. we probably shouldn't have won that game. And then you look at uh, the Bills game, we shouldn't have won that game. You look at the Vikings game, we shouldn't have won that game. There's just there's so many games where it's like we're trailing and there's two minutes left, and I don't think like the offense hasn't done anything. Like the Vikings game, we didn't score a touchdown until within two minutes. None. It was all field goals. How did you beat the Chiefs a couple weeks ago after what you did earlier in the season on Thursday night football where I don't think you scored a touchdown in Kansas City against them. And then you come uh, back, and then you beat them in Denver. We had, yeah, so the second game, we scored two touchdowns and didn't allow Mahomes to get one. And all they had was field goals. But we had three turnovers on him. He had two picks and a fumble. Yeah, but I'm saying in that first Thursday night game, I don't think you guys scored a touchdown. I think all you guys did was kick field goals. Pretty much. That's all. That's why I got Will Lutz on my fantasy team now. Because all we kick is field goals. And then you came back and beat Kansas City a couple weeks later. And I'm like, wait. That same team that only kicked field goals a couple weeks ago just did that to the defending Super Bowl champions? What? Yep. Well, and that's, that's one thing to look for in this game. Because you've got the Browns who have the uh, the offense that has turned the ball over the most against the Broncos, who is second in forcing turnovers. Yeah, I would imagine it's probably going to be, if you guys go with a man-to-man -man defense, which from what you're saying, it sounds like that's what you're going to do. Um, it, My guess is Pat Sertan's going to go against Amari Cooper. So I, this, again, I need, this is where I'm going to need Elijah Moore, David Bell, Cedric Tillman, maybe he sees the field a little bit. Um, David and Joku. If Amari Cooper is taken away, which given what Pat Sertan can do, I feel like Amari Cooper is not going to be much of a factor in this game. So Elijah Moore, David Bell, Cedric Tillman, David and Joku, Kareem, or yeah, Kareem Hunt. Like, let's see you guys get involved in the passing game. Like, I don't think we'll use Jerome Ford, really, in the passing game. I think he's more of a traditional running back. But during his first date in Cleveland, we did use uh, Kareem Jack. I keep wanting to say Kareem Jackson. No, Kareem Hunt. We used him as a wide receiver at times. So mm -hmm. maybe that's something we should utilize in this game. Because, again, I think... Denver's going to focus on taking Amari Cooper away. So I need to see some of the other 
weapons step up. Kind of like what you were saying, where if we try to take uh, Cortland Sutton away, you want to see Jaleel McLaughlin, Jerry Judy, um, Javante Williams, and some of those guys step up. It's Again, this is going to be... It, it's like these two teams are looking in a mirror at each other. Almost. Yep, I, I think the game plan is going to be the same for both, right? Um, Denver is going to want to establish a run, and I think the Browns are going to establish the run. Yeah, this feels this feels like it's going to be like a a a trench game where who's ever whoever can establish their offensive line first is going to win the game because. You know, your defensive line is nothing to sneeze at. You guys have a pretty good defensive line. Randy, Randy Gregory, you brought him in from Dallas. Or what? We traded, we traded him to the Niners. Oh. I just yeah, looked Gregory's, at it. Gregory's on the Niners, and uh, who else did we trade? We traded somebody else. I don't huh. remember. Uh, but, yeah, Randy Gregory's on the Niners, so now it's Cooper, Browning, um, why can't I? Benito and there's one other one. I don't remember who the other one is, but then defensive line is Zach Allen, DJ Jones, Mike Purcell, and yeah, I think that's about it. That's weird because I'm looking on the Broncos, um, rock defensive roster on ESPN, and maybe it's because I'm looking at the stats. But it still has Randy Gregory on there at linebacker for you. But when yep, I, we got we traded him to the Niners. Yes, when I put click on his name, it shows him with the 49ers. So my mistake there. But still, like, like you were just mentioning, you guys have a decent defensive line, not as good as ours, I would say. But still, like, it's gonna be trench warfare. Yeah. You got a you got a score prediction for me? Ooh. I'll say this. Even though I'm a diehard Browns fan, if I don't think the Browns are going to win a game, then I'm not going to predict them to. But I think we're, we've are we been playing a little bit better than Denver as of recently. Um, so I'm going to go 21-17 Browns. Man, I was going to call this like a 14-10 Broncos game. Because I think the defense is just going to be killing it. So way lower scoring. Okay. Yeah. Offense is trying to figure out. Defense is balls to the walls the whole game. I think it's going to be a low scoring game. <laughs> and then watch. It ends up being like a 33 to 31 type game. Yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't shock me. Because that's what happened with the game a couple weeks ago when we were playing the Colts in Indianapolis. I thought, like, since it was P.J. Walker going against Gardner Minshew, I mm -hmm. thought it was going to be a low-scoring game. Um, and then it, it ended up being, like, I'd have to go back and look at the final score, but it ended up being, like, 39-33 or something, something in that range. And I'm like, what? Where did that score come from? Mm-hmm. So, you got any final thoughts on this game? I don't think so. Outside of what we already talked about, I, I think it's going to be a defensive struggle with the offense is still trying to figure it out. I think uh, Miles Garrett's going to put pressure on Russell Wilson. I think Zach Allen's going to get pressure on the DTR. And I think it's going to be a defensive slugfest. As do I. I got a little bit higher scoring than you, but... That's going to do it for this week's episode of the Sports Room Talk Show. I appreciate you coming in and talking Broncos Browns with me. Um, it's always fun hearing the opponent's perspective. Um, and make sure if you subscribe to MHRT Network on YouTube. They are awesome. I, I That's how I found you guys is I saw your live stream last week during the Vikings Broncos game and I'm like okay I'll reach out to them and then we connected from there so 
Yeah, and if, and if anybody can't watch the Broncos Browns game and wants to just listen in, we do a live watch party for every Broncos game. So if you want to tune in today, we'll be doing one today for the Broncos Browns game. If you can't watch it, you can follow along with us. Sweet. I'm gonna I'm def DVR in this game because I have to work the Raptors Cavaliers game at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse tonight while the game is happening. So I'll be sure to fo- still follow along in some capacity. But um, until next time, I'm Unger to the max. That's you. You go ahead and say your name. Mundung is creepy. <laughs> there we go from MHRT Network. And we will see you next time. A salute to you.